Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Dave. I'm a parent of a daughter in college, and we live in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. Good morning, friends. A couple of big announcements that I want to talk to you about the FAFSA Simplification Act, the biggest overhaul in the FAFSA in decades. It goes into effect for the rising senior class. And then we have a brand new interview on Summer Melt with Andre Phillips, Director of Undergraduate Admissions, UW-Madison. So friends, depending on when you're listening to this, if you're listening to this between 6 a.m. and 11 a.m. on Monday, then I'm driving on my way to Vanderbilt. If you catch it between 1.30 to 5, I'll be at Vanderbilt. I'm going to be on the Sweet Tea Tour. It's 45 college coaches from all over the country, and we're visiting 10 schools in Tennessee. I'll quickly give you the schools in order. Vanderbilt, Belmont, Middle Tennessee State, University of the South Sewanee, University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, University of Tennessee at Knoxville, East Tennessee State, Carson Newman, Tennessee Tech, and Lipscomb. And I'll definitely be doing some college spotlights from this group. Uh, There are a few on here I've really wanted to do for some time. Can't tell you for sure which ones because I haven't decided yet whether I'll be giving my rendition, my breakdown of the visit. Sometimes I'm so impressed with a senior level admissions person that we meet, like I was at uh, Puget Sound, that I choose to have an interview with them instead of, you know, me doing the the spotlight. But I can tell you going in the school's. I'm most likely to do them on because they're ones I was very interested in doing spotlights on for you before the trip. And in many cases, we've had requests. And those are actually the first three schools right out of the gate, Vanderbilt, Belmont, and MTSU, Middle Tennessee State. And then skip down a few more, University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Those are the four I'm most likely to either do spotlights on um, or do an interview, which is also just a different form of a spotlight. Now, you might be saying, what about Sewanee, University of the South? We've done that before. So that's why I never mentioned that. But some of the others, like Tennessee Tech, Lipscomb, UTC, East Tennessee, Carson Newman, we'll see. If I think there's something there that would be of great interest to you, we'll come back and do a spotlight on them. Okay, very exciting news. A former math professor turned billionaire hedge funder, James Simons, has donated $500 million, $500 million to his former employer, Stony Brook University. Now, this came out last Thursday. This staggering $500 million contributions from the foundations overseen by James and his wife, who happens to be an alumna of Stony Brook, Marilyn Simons. This is being touted as the largest unrestricted donation to a college and U.S. history. Now, I need to do a double take on that because there have been a couple billion dollar gifts that we've talked about on here. Uh, one to Stanford not too long ago. And then, of course, many of you will remember Bloomberg's gift to Johns Hopkins. But those were restricted gifts, which means that the donor tells the school where they want the money to go. Unrestricted means the donor gives the gift, steps out of the way and says, I trust you to use your discretion. You know your needs better than I do. Go at it. And I want to give a shout out to Brooke Stanford. Uh, he's a diehard listener from New York who's a member of what I call our listening family. That's my name for people who never miss an episode. He's the one who tipped me off about this. So shout out to Brooke. Okay. A lot of people ask me, and I've talked about it here on the podcast, do I think there's a high likelihood that we'll see a reversal and a lot of schools will go back to being test mandatory? And if you're a regular listener, you know I'm very skeptical about that. And I want to give you 
a case study of why I feel so strongly. And it has to do with the state I live in, the state of Georgia. So let's just flash back and look at where Georgia has been on test scores. 2020, the first year the pandemic broke out, nobody could even get to a test center. They made the test optional for everybody. Florida was the only state that required tests in 2020. In 2021, well, let me take a step back. Georgia said, but we will be returning to test scores in 2021. So they attempted to return to mandatory test scores in 2021. But it was such a disaster that way into the season, I mean, in the spring, they had to take that back because so many students had applications that were all but completed other than testing. So way in the 11th hour, they altered their policy for all but Georgia, Georgia Tech. Then what did they do last year? They come up with a whole new policy. They say for Georgia and Georgia Tech, which have long been the crown jewels of the state, they get the most money. They're by far the most selective. They pretty much yield anybody against any other of the 26 public schools. Extremely rare. Every now and then Georgia State might get a win, but it's rare. So they required scores for those two schools. For every other school in the state, with the exception of Georgia College, which is the third most selective school, Georgia's Public Liberal Arts College, they had a test score. If you hit that score, then you don't have to submit scores. So they went from like a 3.4 for schools like Georgia State and Augusta University. And then a lot of the schools were 3.2 and then some are 3.0. So they went to, you hit this GPA, you don't have to submit scores. All right. Here's an announcement. And this came out a few weeks ago. I'm just announcing it now. It appeared in the Associated Press. I'll read the title and then go into it. Georgia won't demand SAT or ACT tests to enter most public colleges. So no more minimum tests, which they tried before. Now, I'm going to read a little bit of this to you, and then the most important thing is the reason. Students applying to 23 of Georgia's 26 public universities and colleges need not take the SAT or ACT to apply. Regents voted to let students apply without tests through 24-25. They still can't really figure out their act. I mean, they keep changing. They should put this out for like three years if they really want to do it. But anyway, and at that time, they will reevaluate. All right. Tests will remain required for the University of Georgia and Georgia Tech. And then for Georgia College and State, they're kind of in a little bit of an exp- in Millersville, kind of in an experimental phase. They're actually resuming a test requirement. And what chance does Sunny Purdue characterize it as an experiment? They want to see how requiring the test impacts applications. And they've gone on the record that says if it adversely impacts uh, applications, then they'll provide funding to help cover the gap. So they're using Georgia College as a little bit of an experiment, like a lab. All right. Now, here's the interesting part. When the system reimposed testing requirements for admissions in the fall of 2022, it found that applications fell and many students did not finish their applications for lack of a test score. Regents hastily made tests optional for all but Georgia and Georgia Tech in March of 2022. Told you they did it late in the spring. But Scott Lingrell, the system's vice chancellor for enrollment manager, said it was already too late for students' numbers to recover. Here's a quote. We did go back to test optional, but during that time, many students already made their college choices. They'd already decided to go elsewhere, Lingrell told Regents. During a meeting at the University of North Georgia in Dahlonega, this year, with test optional at 24 schools, Lingro said there's been a big increase in applications and in students accepting offers of admission. Here's, here's a line that really tells a story. He said system leaders fear that reimposing the requirement could drive more students to other schools, especially public universities in neighboring states which will hurt already sagging enrollment numbers and pressure finances. In other words, we can't afford to go test optional because students are now in a position where they have too many choices where they don't. Sorry. In other words, we cannot afford to require tests because schools have too many, because students have too many choices where they can just go to a neighboring state and not submit scores. And it's going to lead to enrollment 
declines and therefore financial declines in most of our public colleges. That's when you know that the test optional movement has leverage. It's not even about our test scores and grades, better predictors than just grades. And does the pressure that kids are under need to be factored in or the test prep industry or the stress or admission officers biased by scores and unduly allowing them to influence how they refile? It's none of that stuff. It's just we need to have our schools full. And it's going to make it harder for us to do that if we have an impediment that our competition doesn't have. But I just want to tell you that's why I am very optimistic that we're going to stay in this test optional state for the foreseeable future for the overwhelming lion's share of schools. All right, different topic. This is something I went back and forth about sharing. So our regular listeners know our motto is making college knowledge available to all. And Anika and I, when we first started the podcast in our planning phase in August of 2017, we always had the goal to level the playing field. It was always our desire to provide the same knowledge for all families as those working with the most skilled private college counselor. And we work off of the assumption that our listeners are going to be flying solo without a private college coach and building their lists and working on admission strategies, essays, and all that. That's our default. That's our assumption. So much so that this right now may be the first time I've ever even mentioned the name School Match for You, which is a company that I founded back in 2010 that does do independent college counseling. Now, do people reach out and hire us anyway? Yeah, we get, we get contacted every week. And we're grateful for that. I've met some extraordinary people from people who reached out. In fact, Linda and Lisa, regular listeners back in 2018 and never missed an episode, reached out for help with their own daughters. And now they're members of our team. I found out how incredibly talented and extraordinary they were and <clears throat> realized with some additional training, they'd be unbelievable in this role. And here they are. So those are just two of many, many examples of fantastic, great people that we've met from reaching out to us. and. I'll be completely honest with you. If nobody ever reached out to us, I wouldn't be able to justify putting the 20 hours a week in on podcasting. So we are, so we are grateful. Um, so in Wayne, do I mention something I'm about to say versus not mentioning? It was tough because I'm always trying to speak to the 99.9% who will never hear from versus the 0.1%. But we pride ourselves on making our college counseling very affordable. We don't use a market mentality. What does the market allow you to charge? Charge that. This is capitalism. No, we're always thinking of those who could never afford services and how can we make it affordable for them? And how can we reach people of all incomes? But our, fis our new fiscal year does start July 1 and inflation impacts us as well. And I do want to say that we are having a, a noticeable price increase on July 1st. So if you are one of those listeners that was planning on reaching out to us, uh, we just wanted to let you know you will save money if you do that in the month of June. Now, we've had a few already that want to start in August, but they want to lock in the 2023 rate. We can do that. So if you're interested, just, just shoot me a text at 404-664-4340 and share whatever information you want, and I'll direct you. Um, how you can lock in 2023 pricing if that's something that appeals to you. Okay, now let's get to our real content. So I want to talk to you about FAFSA simplification, and then we have our interview for the day. So the FAFSA is changing what's being called the most significant redesign in decades from the Department of Education. And I want to share with you 12 to 15 significant changes that are occurring in the FAFSA. And I don't have time to do deep dive on them. We will have an interview at some point to explore these more. We had already Mark Kantrowitz on to talk about this a little more than a year ago. Um, nobody knows this stuff better than him. And a lot of what I'm pulling today is his content. But this is going to impact the senior class, like so it's soon. And I think it's important that you you know some of these major changes and what they are and why they're occurring. And I will be honest with you, I think this overhaul is very good. Um, like anything, there's going to be some things people are going to like more than others. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about a lot of things um, in this overhaul. So let's dive in. Well, one thing people will notice immediately is that 
Normally, the FAFSA opens up October 1. This year, it's going to be December 1. And that's just being done so that they can make sure they've worked out all the kinks. Um, it will return back to the normal October 1 um, in 2024. But for 2023, it's going to be December, not October. So there's already a, a, a draft of a new version soliciting comments just to make sure that the kinks got worked out and all those comments had to be received by May 23rd so they can finalize the new version. One of the things you're going to notice right away is reduced questions. That's why it's being called FAFSA Simplification Act. So the current FAFSA has 108 questions, the new one, 46. So it doesn't take uh, a lot of math to know that that's almost a 60% reduction in class in, in the number of questions. Although there are a few classes uh, questions that have multiple parts to them. All right, so what are some of the key highlights in the, in the, in the new FAFSA? Well, you're not going to see the term expected family contribution anymore. When I'm like, hallelujah to that, it was the most confusing term ever. You tell me this is your expected family contribution, then I think, well, this is how much my family can expect to pay. But that's not what the term meant. So it's being changed to student aid index. Very, very, very few schools ever ask people to pay what their expected family contribution was based on the FAFSA. Now, that happens much, much, much more often with the other form, the CSS profile, College Scholarship Search Profile, that about 180 selective colleges with large endowments also use, but not the FAFSA. That, the profile deals with what we call institutional methodology, okay, very complex. I describe it as a smorgasbord of 300 items and Schools can pick and choose which of those items they use to determine how much you're going to pay. FAFSA is federal methodology, so it's standardized for everybody. For some people that think, well, what's the name change have to do with anything? And names are important. Names define perception. If you want to communicate clearly, then it's important. So I, I celebrate and welcome that change. Okay, and this is the one that's the most controversial. It has to do with multiple kids in college. So one thing to keep in mind is that Lamar Alexander, former representative of Tennessee, he was really the leader on this new initiative, and he felt very strongly that it wasn't fair to have a discount to parents that have a couple of kids in college at the same time versus a couple that spread them out four years apart. So when, as soon as one gets out of college, the next one goes in. So in the past, there was a 50% break on an expected family contribution if you had two kids in college, a 66% break if you had three. So for example, if your expected family contribution was 50 with one kid, well, if you had two in, then it was 25 each when two kids were in college. So that is going to be eliminated, and that's causing a lot of consternation. But here's the one thing that I want to encourage people to understand. One, almost all schools that used the FAFSA as their primary tool for determining how much money would be awarded they did not meet a family's full need. So they did not use the expected family contribution, now going to be called the student aid index, aid index, to determine what your aid award was. The schools that do that overwhelmingly use the profile. And the profile is still going to take number of kids in college into consideration. So that's really, really important. That covers the lion's share of these. Now, there are some cases where schools did use um, the FAFSA to influence need-based aid. Um, but they're few and, and far between. And many schools are still going to be using professional judgment. And I'll say more about that because professional judgment has been expanded in this new FAFSA. So that's not as big of an issue as people think. The, most of the brouhaha about FAFSA simplification has been about this point. And people are like, I'm going to get killed. And I don't see that happening. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very surprised to be hearing horror stories about I was being asked to pay this so much, and I have a second kid in college, and it went up drastically. Like I said, most schools that are using the FAFSA, they're usually tying their aid award, usually, honestly, to some merit component um, that's linked to GPA or test scores or sometimes other forms of merit, not to this form. The primary way, reason way this is used is to see if somebody qualifies for federal money, Pell Grant and FSEOG. That is a factor. And I'm going to talk more about that because that's been expanded too. In a, in a way where a lot more people are going to qualify for federal money than before. But I'll get to that in a second. All right. Third, another point. The new FAFSA will impact small business owners and those who have family farms. And a lot of people in Iowa are really up ha not happy about this. 
because there was an incredible perk in the old FAFSA that you didn't see with the profile. You could have a business with 100 employees and make $10 million a year, and it was invisible. It was shielded. It didn't count in how the FAFSA looked at income and assets. Now, that is no longer going to be the case. And family farms also were excluded. You know, and now that is not long, no longer the case. And this wasn't true for the profile. This was only the FAFSA. Now, let's say you have an under-resourced family making $40,000 a year. You have another family and have a business. They have 95 employees, brings in $10 million a year. Is it really fair for that to be invisible if the goal is fairness? I don't think so. So certainly if you're somebody in that category, you're not going to be happy about it. But I'm just, I just think it's fair, the new change. And I realize that won't make everybody happy, but I owe you guys my honesty. Change four. This is another one that people aren't going to like, but it's another one that quite honestly is fair. So in the past, if you had a family that was either divorced, separated, or never married, then the FAFSA only asked one thing. They said, who's the custodial parent? And then they defined it as the parent that the student lived with 51% of the time or more. So I had a student I worked with 15 years ago. Mom made 65000 Dad made four hundred. Student lived mostly with the mom. Dad's money was invisible on the FAFSA, but the profile caught that. And the profile asked for that non-custodial parent, what, what's now referred to as parent two, to have to submit their financial information. It was one of the biggest loopholes out there and the easiest ways for, for somebody to hide money if they really understood how the FAFSA worked. I literally had a family when they found this up that decided to separate and said they would get back together after. But for now, they're going to do what they need to do to get the money. I did not approve of that. That was their decision. But the point is, there were lots of ways you could scam the FAFSA in, in the old system. So that's no longer going to be the case because the new formula, it's going to look at the parent who has spent the most money on the child, and they'll be expected to complete the FAFSA. So it's not going to be like the profile that asks, usually asks for both parents in most cases. It's going to ask for the one that supports the child the most to be the one who's going to have to use their income and assets as a basis to determine eligibility. All right, let's look at another change. And this is a change people do like, and um, and I think it's great. So starting with 2425, um, if you had a 529 that was not in your name, your name, student's name, or parent's name, but it was in like an aunt, an uncle, or somebody else, or a grandparent. This gets a little technical. I'll try to make it quick. The way that is going to be assessed now is going to be much, much more beneficial to the student. So in the past, that was considered untaxed income that the, in the student's name, which was assessed at 50%. So in other words, um, you know, you got 20000 from a grandparent, and that's looked at like the student making 10000 which increases your income and greatly decreased your ability to receive need-based financial aid. Well, now that's going to be treated as an asset, not income, and assets are assessed at 5%. Big, big, big difference. So that $20,000 would result in about a $1,000 increase in your student aid index, where before it was substantial. So that's a big change that will lead to a um, greater financial need on the part of the student. All right, change. Number six, this change has to do with it being much easier to qualify for Pell Grants in the new system for a lot of reasons. It's expected 1.7 million students will qualify for the maximum Pell Grant in this new system, and that about 550,000 students that never received, were not eligible for the FAFSA, sorry, for the Pell Grant before, will now be eligible for the Pell Grant. Well, how does that happen? Well, there's a couple reasons why students are going to be able to make more money and be eligible still to receive Pell Grants. Part of it has to do with how the income protection allowance is going to be interpreted. Now, I'm not trying to get too much in the weeds, but sort of have to get a little bit in the weeds on this. 
So the income protection allowance is there's a certain amount of money that a family needs just basically to live for subsistence, right? I mean, you have to be able to have food. You have to be able to have shelter. Like, you know, you just you just do. And so it's not fair to start taking some of your minimalist money and expect it to go right away toward paying for college. And so in the new system, what's going to happen is that there's going to you're going to call there's going to be more money that's sheltered or protected from being taxed from being assessed at all in the FAFSA. So the parent income protection allowance is going to go up uh, from four to eight thousand for most families, and then the income protection allowance for dependent students about twenty four hundred, independent students thirty eight hundred to sixty one hundred, and single parents about sixty five hundred dollars. So what does this mean? So this is great. Okay, it basically means you can make more money and have a lower student aid index, or what used to be called expected family contribution. All right, so that's really, really good. There's some other changes as well. And in the past, you really didn't find very many families that made over $60,000 with one kid in college with what we call typical assets that could still qualify for a Pell Grant. But now the adjusted gross income cutoff for Pell Grant eligibility is going to be $64,000.90 for a dependent student with a single parent, and then another $16,705 if you have a sibling. So, you know, and if you have uh, two parents, dependent students with two parents, the AGI cutoff is going to be $68,365 plus $14,135 per sibling. So the bottom line is the family can make more money and still receive the Pell Grant. That's just just the bottom line if you want to just get shut uh, right to the nub of it. All right, there's some other changes that I think um, would be of interest to you, and I'll share some of these. And I'm not sharing all of them, but I'm going to share an article if you really want to get into the weeds. And you know, you're saying, aren't you getting in the weeds now? Well, probably am, but I want you guys to, to have some knowledge. So incarcerated students that are in federal and state penal facilities, they will be able to get federal pen- Pell Grants, starting with the 23-24 academic year, Okay. Um, that's a new change. The IRS data retrieval tool is being replaced with the IRS direct data exchange. And it's going to be mandatory, but by filling out the FAFSA, applicants and their spouse consent to using the IRS transferring federal tax information to the FAFSA. And I know everyone who's done this before may be familiar with the term FSA ID. Well, it will be required for all applicants, spouses, and parents, but parents who are not U.S. citizens or permanent residents, they're going to be able to get an FSA ID even though they do not have a Social Security number. And that's going to be great because that's going to lead to much less what's called FAFSA verification. Uh, You know, I should have just said something right from the start. FAFSA stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And if you want to get federal free money, like Pell Grant, FSEOG, you have to fill out the FAFSA. If you want to get the federal direct student loan, which is usually the best student loan that you can get, lots of reasons, no cosigner, no credit check, you know, <clears throat> low rates, fixed rates, potential for flexible repayment plans, and even potential for loan forgiveness, let alone things like forbearance, you have to fill out the FAFSA. If you want to take out a plus loan, you have to fill out the FAFSA. If you want to get work study, you have to fill out the FAFSA. So, that's what this FAFSA thing's all about. All right, here's, a, here's another change people are going to like a lot. The new FAFSA will allow students to list as many as 20 colleges on their FAFSA application. In the past, 10 was the max. And you say, well, what if I have more than 20? Well, that's going to be similar to how it used to work, where you can put 20 on initially, then you wait until schools get the confirmation, and then you can go in and add additional schools. Okay. Now in the past, it was called the student aid report. Sorry, you might've heard us mention that before. Now they're calling it the FAFSA submission summary. And I'm not too crazy about that. I think you have so many changes, you could kept the same name, but anyway, I don't want to quibble about something minor there. And a couple more changes and I'm going to call it a wrap. So there's a few different types of income that no longer will be reported on the FAFSA. 
One is workman's compensation. Another is veteran education benefits. Another change is the lowest a, uh, a family's student aid index could have been under the EFC was zero. Now it can be negative 1,500. So you literally could show that you have a need greater than zero, which potentially could allow a school to increase its aid award to a student or maybe cover your computer or something like that. And the last thing I want to share is appeals. So the financial aid process was very difficult for appeals under FAFSA. It's been made easier. So and sometimes people re refer to this as professional judgment review. Colleges can no longer have a policy that says that they deny all aid appeals. They could have done that before. Every appeal has to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And this includes special circumstances such as real estate losses, unusual business investments, severe disability to the student, spouse, or parent. So schools have to consider these appeals. Now, if you're really interested in getting in the weeds on this, I encourage you to look up an article by Mark Kantrowitz. It's the best I've seen. He's the best in the business. This guy's written over 10,000 articles, appeared before Congress crazy numbers of times on financial matters. And we've had him on our podcast twice. But his article's entitled How FAFSA Simplification Will Change Financial Aid Eligibility just came out in April. It's, I've read a lot on this topic. I think he's got the best. And now this week's interview with a special guest. All right, let's get away from the weeds. Time for our interview. It's with Andre Phillips, the Director of Admission at UW-Madison. If that name sounds familiar, I interviewed Andre a few months ago. And I'll be completely honest with you. We recorded this interview on Summer Mount at that same time. But I wanted to run it when people are actually thinking about the topic of Summer Mount. And I'm going to shock the world here by letting you know it's a one-parter. Yes, I'm actually capable of doing a one-part interview. For those of you who like to hear the whole interview at one time, you'll get your wish today. So in this interview, Andre talks about what Summer Melt is. He talks about why Summer Melt occurs. And he talks about the questions and topics that parents and students need to be discussing with each other now. Listen and enjoy. Friends, you're in for a real treat today. You're here with someone I've known for almost 20 years Welcome to the Your College Bound Kid podcast, Andre. Mark, it's great to be with you. Well, friends, uh, we're going to take advantage of some of uh, Andre's 40 plus years experience. And let's start out with Summer Melt. Tell our listeners what Summer Melt is and what are some of the reasons why Summer Melt occurs? Sure. Uh, a great place to start. Um, so in our, uh, in our profession, uh, as you can imagine, uh, we are dependent on 17, 18, and 19-year-olds uh, to make life-changing decisions about their future. Uh, and we are also expecting those same 17, 18, and 19-year-olds to be able to know enough about what they envision for themselves to oftentimes make a decision when they have other good choices about where they would spend the next four or five years in, uh, of their lives, all at this very tender age of 17, 18, 19. And so they're oftentimes students as the uh, candidate reply date, whatever date that might be, it could be May 1, it could be sooner, to say, not only do I like that I've been admitted to college or university X, here's what's in the gift bag of admission, the offer I've been given. And it sounds great. And I went for a campus tour even, and I met these really excited, happy, bright, smart, good looking students. And I wanna be one of them at that institution. And so sometimes in the, in the purchase, if I dare use that uh, term here, in the purchase of the college of choice, uh, students don't always pull the curtain back fully uh, to better understand how that choice uh, really will impact what these young people are thinking about. That's but one scenario. And so students melt away, language we use, 
but they further reflect upon their choice. They learn more about themselves. They learn more about their other options. And even after that deadline date, that that candidate reply date, some students will say, well, in fact, now that I've thought about it more, I've reflected, I've learned more, I may need to go. I think I, I'm better suited to go somewhere else. Again, this is but one scenario. Another scenario that, that is actually real for a, a lot of students who melt away, who, who say yes on one date and change their minds, their family circumstances, their own circumstances may change. So, for example, uh, students and their families may continue to look at uh, what's affordable and determine that the price tag of the university that they've uh, fallen in like with uh, makes it prohibitive for students to enroll. And so for some students and some families, the reality of what's affordable and another option, maybe closer to home or it, whatever those additives are, uh, may direct students to say, thank you very much, Institution A, uh, but I can't make it. I, I, I have to do something different. And again, there are a host of scenarios. I think about this a lot. And, and uh, as we imagine, how do we retain our students? We have this window where we expect students, because we are not an early decision, where we don't lock students in, we give them flexibility here at the UW. Students will decide before the, the 1st of May because they want to secure housing or they, there are a number of things in the transitional period leading up to May 1. A lot of time transpires between May 1 and September 1 when students show up. And during that period of time, institutions like, like ours and others are also in the business of continuing to provide transitional information. We have something here, and it happens on many, many campuses, a summer orientation period where students take placement exams, they meet with advisors, for some, the campus orientation meeting is the first time parents set foot on our campus. It might be, for some of our admitted students, the first time they're actually here. And if they've never visited campus and they've only looked at our videos or looked at our brochures, they create an image of the community they learn further when they're here. Now, it's rare that students melt away at the point of orientation, but it might happen. So the last thing I'll say about what it is, is this idea that uh, students continue to consider their choices. Institutions are aware of this. And so this information that I alluded to a moment ago is at once uh, designed to help students secure their place in the class, but it is also uh, a moment of preventive fleeing, if I can dare say that, because we want students to not only be as excited as they were when they received their offer of admission, as excited as they were when they made their choice across other good choices, when they show up for orientation or begin the process of securing their, their place in the class, we want that, that same equal excitement about what their collegiate experiences will be once the clock starts in the fall. So you've mentioned a few things. You've talked about as you get a greater understanding of yourself, you may realize that uh, maybe the place I originally chose is not in alignment with my understanding of myself. And of course, that could be all kinds of things from majors to what you're looking for, distance from home, size, all those things. You've talked about financial barriers and family circumstances changing. You've also talked about maybe getting to the campus and it not aligning with your, you know, figment in your mind, your mental image of how you thought it would be. Uh, what about the person that just doesn't 
check their portal or doesn't open emails and isn't getting communication uh, that the school is sending? Do you see that uh, resulting in melt ever? Yeah, we we absolutely do, Mark. And and unfortunately, I think for and this happens in all sectors of life, institutions and and our institution is no different uh, than others. We send a lot of information. And in some cases, we believe that students are just overwhelmed uh, with, I, I have three more emails and I have two more emails and I have boxes to click and, and that the, they're just like, wait a minute, the rest of my life is on, is ongoing. This is not. And, and so unfortunately, uh, students will miss important information because that's securing the class, as it were, after the candidate reply date is critically important to the institution and being able to message and communicate to students, you have to pay attention to uh, the next email or the next message, or maybe there's a letter in the mail. We still send uh, snail mail. Uh, You have to pay attention to these things because these efforts are date and deadline driven. There's work to be done in these spaces. And so we try to in the engagement with students, even before they are made aware of of a decision that's being made about their candidacy. We try to encourage uh, students and their families to pay attention to the mail. Now, here's a cautionary tale in this. And we know that there are many, many parents who who want to continue to support their children uh, in this process. They're proud of their young people. And in virtually every case, young people, they get their best choices and they have choices. But we also want young people uh, to take control of their admissions process, their yielding process or matriculation or decision making. And that doesn't mean that parents should step out of the way and step away. Just stand next to uh, uh, your sons and your daughters Help them when, when the language we use uh, might be confusing or when young people are in that decisioning mode. Remember, it is their collegiate experience, their education, uh, but we as adults and we as parents can be vitally important to the process as we've been up to the point of submission of application, as we've been once students Uh, if you will, metaphorically lay out the decisions on the kitchen table uh, and the discussion about the pros and cons of that place versus this place. We're in the conversation. The the final decision, however, belongs to young people. And in this case where students are not as attentive to the mail and the dates and the deadlines and the forms that need to be returned and and all of this, if you will, business part of, of choosing a university or a college, we can nudge we shouldn't do. Uh, we can nudge our young people to open the mail. We can nudge our young people to pay attention to the reply date. We can nudge our young people, but we shouldn't do it for them. And I talk to parents about this in the, in the manner of that first college quiz. And this is a real thing. Uh, Students are accustomed to taking exams in high school and the pop quiz in the class and those sorts of things. But just as parents are not in high school classes, they are even further removed from the collegiate experience. And the sooner young people are empowered uh, to master their own lives in this way, dates and deadlines is what we're talking about. I think the better they will be at taking control of the business side of their collegiate education. And I don't think we talk to our young people enough about uh, they might not think of this as a business enterprise, uh, but it is. So from a practical standpoint, uh, I love the word nudge and there's nudge programs out there. We use them to KIPP. And I like the distinction between 
not opening the mail, but nudging. Any other practical things a parent can do, because that's mostly our audience. Some parents get pretty sophisticated about finding ways to get their have their student hear certain episodes, play it while they're in the car, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> certain sections that they might want to say, but they want to have another voice say it. But uh, any anything else you can think of a parent can do besides nudge their student to open the mail? So I, here's what uh, I think this is a great question, Mark. Here's what I think about this, uh, and I would imagine uh, my, my, my peers and my friends who sit in similar seats uh, think, about, uh, think about these things all the time, right? But here's what I, uh, and I hope folks have heard it before, but here's where I think this starts. The college decision-making process doesn't start when the decisions roll in. Setting, if you will, the ground rules, or uh, as I like to think about it, how do you uh, martic- uh, articulate yourself around the field? And I use sports analogies a lot, so I'm going to use one here, uh, because I think this this is more than just a metaphor. I think it's a reality. Think about this as a, as if you will, for a moment, uh, as a football field. And the goal in football is to score touchdowns. Uh, The consolation prize is to kick a field goal. You get some points, but you don't get as many as you get when you play football, right? Or score a touchdown while you're playing football. So think about it this way. Let's say you start on your own 20-yard line. So I hope there are some folks who follow football and Mm -hmm. and I don't lose you. But the important thing is you start start on your own 20-yard line. Every 10 yards, if you get them in in four plays or less, you get another four plays. And so you matriculate on down the field. Uh, Great coach said this way back in the 60s, and I say it to this day. You matriculate your way down the field to score a touchdown. And so the same thing is applicable uh, if you're thinking about the college search process. You are working your way to the goal of being admitted, and it doesn't start in the senior year. It starts before then. And so for parents, what's really important uh, is to understand that your ninth grader or your 10th grader, maybe your 11th grader uh, is not yet a senior admitted to college. And so you start small, right? You, If you will, one more bad analogy. Your first down, you probably want that to be a running play. And you hope to get between four and six yards. That's a really good running play, right? Now you have three downs to make four yards. And so you have some options available to you. So what is the running play uh, when you start with your 10th grader? Let's start with your 10th grader. It's probably, as you've alluded to, Mark, when do you capture your young people and they can't run away, uh, they can't go answer the telephone, or they, you know, they're not, mom's not calling from the other room, or you're in the car with dad, or you're in the car with mom, and you just start talking about college. And what you don't say is, what do you want to major in in college? You've, that, that's the wrong question. But really start talking about, hey, you know, when you go to college and you, you, you just start having, because you want to establish some common ground. And by the time you get to midfield, right? So are you on the 40, 49 yard line in your opponent's end of the field? Now you're getting close to scoring uh, a touchdown. And that's typically in the junior year. And maybe you sort of talk about, hey, what do you think if we took a, uh, there are two or three colleges within drive. What if we took a day and, you know, we'll go visit College X and after that we'll go for ice cream or, you know, how about I, I go buy you a T-shirt or you, those sneakers. I'm aging myself when I <laughs> use these terms. But the idea is that it becomes as opposed to this pressure pack over and it becomes something that's natural or more natural. Again, you're matriculating down the field. Let's not lose sight of that, uh, that you can then have the more involved conversations because you're junior as opposed to your sophomore or your first year, like college. I, I've got, I'm not thinking about that. Now it's starting to be real. 
And here's why it's important to start early. You're starting early because there is another conversation that parents are not in. And that is the locker room conversation, wherever the lockers are, and conversations that young people are having with their friends. And the things they're talking about with their friends are likely not the things they're talking about with their parents. And so in some ways you want to counterbalance uh, students talking to their friends and students talking to adults. And it's not just parents who are chattering about college. It's mostly in the high school, uh, uh, folks in the counseling office or in the classroom. And so you get closer to how you can have the informed conversation. So when you make the official visit, hopefully in the summer, maybe the spring of the junior year, or certainly at the beginning of the senior year of high school, and I will say, August 1, just before school start, uh, whenever s- school will start in the senior year, now it's live theater. And if it's live theater, you should be somewhere around the 30-yard line. <laughs> so now you're within field goal range. The goal is still to, to score a touchdown. But when you get to the 30-yard line, Most coaches have plays that they've developed that they feel really confident. If executed, we're going to score. Or if nothing else, we will be inside the 20-yard line. We can see the goal line now. We can see uh, that that if, if two or three more plays work the way we've designed them, touchdown. And so last thing I'll say about this, and, and I, as you can tell, this is, this is a favorite of mine. Uh, what's important then, because you've established a foundation by which you will talk about the college process, it is no longer scary for parents or for students. Along the way, parents and students independently, collectively, have learned some important things about the language that colleges and universities use. So you're not frightened at all or threatened by the idea that uh, you've got to pick a major. Maybe you don't want to pick a major. You just want to go to college. You you like a lot of things. You've, you've studied really hard in school. You've gotten good high school grades, but you don't know what you want to major in. You might have an idea about what you'd like to do as a working professional, but that could be fundamentally different than what you major in. And so if you've established some of this, these ground rules and ways that you can talk about it, when it's time to answer some of the really important questions, and one of them is, when are applications due? That's question number one. Number two, not only when are applications due, what's required? You can then talk about these things because you know, and that's where you, you see the diversion begin. And this is the last thing I say about this the diversions between what students are expected to do and what parents are expected to do. And I hit you with three very quick things that I think uh, is really important for parents. Number one, think about your ability to afford the schools that you believe your student will have on their list. And to be able to honestly talk to your child about that in the summer before the senior year. You don't want to talk to them in March and April once they're sitting at the kitchen table and they, they've been admitted to all of these wonderful places with these $70,000 price tags, and that creates a challenge to the family resources. Bad example, but one that I think is worthwhile. Number two, you will have established in the eyes of your children, even in the college selection process, that is their choice, it's not your choice or that they're not choosing a school because this is the school you want. It is their choice. They may ultimately choose the same, and you all will be in agreement about the same institution, but there won't be that pressure. And we could talk about the pressure that young people bring to college campuses. Maybe if you decide to invite me back, we ah. can talk about it in more detail. But, it, but it's a really important notion, I would imagine, your other guests have talked about this. Uh, But number three, and this is the most important in my mind, I think making sure that there's an understanding about um, whether or not uh, cost is a challenge or it's not on the table. And if it's not on the table, that's an easy one, right? You say, son, daughter, 
uh, child, you know, apple of my eye. Uh, you needn't worry about whether or not your mom and I can take care of this or mom saying that dad, dad's good. You take it off the table. But if, 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 if it might, if cost might be a challenge, you can talk, you can talk about it so that there's a shared understanding of what it means. So last thing, and this is, I think, the important role for parents, develop the questions that they're concerned about uh, independent of what their sons and daughters are, are concerned about. And don't engage those questions over the questions that your children are interested in. It's good to have them. You need them. You might be concerned about safety. You might be concerned about, uh, I've talked about cost a lot. You might be concerned about what happens if, if my, my, my child changes their mind about a particular major that they indicate. You may have those questions, or you may just simply want to know who's going to teach my child, what's going to happen, where will they live? All of those questions are parental questions uh, that should be developed. There will be a time uh, uh, for answers. I argue the time for those questions, uh, for the most part, when it comes down to having choices. Right, because if a student is applying to seven places, you don't ask those questions of seven institutions. I mean, some of the stuff you can learn by doing your own homework. But when we're coming down to here, the I've got three wonderful options. They're different, and then you're asking from a parent's perspective because your children could be asking something else. I'm going to stop there, Mark. Put a plug in it. Uh, but I hope in all of that, there's a sense of. Uh, there are some clear roles for families. Start early. No, I like how you went there because basically what you said was a lot of melt can be addressed if you prepare and plan on the front end. So you kind of know what you're getting yourself into. Mark, there's nothing like the five P's. I use it every day and I share it here. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. You have to be prepared um, you've heard this, Dan. I mean, you're an educator. You've, you've probably talked to hundreds and hundreds of students. Uh, it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. It is all about preparation, advanced preparation uh, for what's to come. And part of that would be over the summer months, opening the mail, opening the email, checking the portal. Getting in the habit early. Yeah, absolutely. So that it, it's not a new concept. You just you just know I've got to do it right. Because every time you open that email, every time you open that mail that's sitting on the on, on the kitchen table, something good might be there. You, you just, but you won't know if you don't go. <laughs> there you go. On Thursday's episode, Vince is my co-pilot. And we're discussing an article by Jay Matthews that appeared in an opinion column in the L.A. Times entitled Rejected by a Top Tier College. Don't worry, it won't hurt your chances for future success. A question from a listener is from Laura from Washington, D.C., and she's looking for some tips in building a college list for her junior son who is undecided about what he wants to study. We'll have part two of, our, of Lisa's Spotlight on Guilford College and a brand new interview. Lisa conducted with Dr. Lewis Newman, author of the book Thinking Critically in College. The Essential Handbook for Student Success just came out in March of 2023. And I can tell you, this is a fantastic interview you're not going to want to miss. Friends, in closing, I just want to remind you of one thing that I hope will be ringing in your ears, percolating in your mind. And it's this. College is a match to be made and not a prize to be won. See you on Thursday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. 
Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Motvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Taha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stalianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.